It's something that you have said, which has really changed my mindset, but I also find extremely challenging. And I think a lot of women, girls will have the same mindset challenges me is that actually to be lean, you need to eat more because there was a very long period of time where it was calories in, calories out, right? And I mean, we all grew up like the people I was around doing that. And we found like it was successful and it worked. But especially for middle age, that changes. And so the idea to eat more means that you can become leaner is, I mean, amazing, but also I feel like so complex. Can you take us through the science of why this is true? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, I think also we have to bring protein and ultra processed into the conversation. Yes, absolutely. Because if we're looking... Right. So if we're looking at what I mean by eating more, Mm. we're looking at a higher protein intake, we're looking at a wide variety of fruit and veg, eating on a a regular kind of schedule and working with our circadian rhythm. I'm not talking about protein pop tarts and all the like pre wrap protein bars and things like that, but real food, because we're not as smart as mother nature. So we don't, we cannot engineer something that's as good as an orange because it comes with all the extra things in it that makes vitamin C work for us. So when we're talking about eating more to make us lean, one, we are increasing the amount of protein, which is really big in conversations now. And we see with a higher protein intake, we get greater satiation, but also in a calorie deficit, it preserves lean mass. Mm -hmm. And by lean mass, I also mean bone with muscle. So when women are struggling with the concept of eating more, I first get them to eat more protein and not worry so much about the amount of calories that are coming in. Not only we're eating more protein, but we're looking at the timing of that food. Because anytime we have a big hole where we're not eating, like the example of not having lunch Mm -hmm. and having that big hole of time, we get into a breakdown state or catabolic state. And the first thing that goes is lean mass. So if we can support our lean mass, meaning muscle and bone with higher protein, and we're supporting our gut microbiome with more fiber, then we start to see all of these positive changes. Then when we start seeing positive changes and we increase the calorie content by increasing the amount of good foods that we're eating, fats and carbs and that kind of stuff, we're having a kind of a reset with the hypothalamus because now the hypothalamus is like, oh, we have abundance. If we have abundance, that means we can grow lean tissue. Because I think one of the problems with the calories in, calories out is no one describes what we mean by calories. Because if we take 100 calories of an ultra processed food versus 100 calories of a sprouted grain, really whole carbohydrate type food, they react completely differently in the body. So we have to be very conscious of what we're talking about. That's why I don't really like to use calories or Mm. macros. I like to describe the kinds of foods that we want to to have in our bodies. So when we start really looking at increasing our overall intake and timing the intake appropriately with our circadian rhythm and the way our body needs food, which means during the day, then we see a kind of a relax where the body's like, we don't need this extra body fat. We definitely don't need to hold on to visceral fat, which is the dangerous deep abdominal fat. We see body composition shifts and It's great. And we also see with that higher protein intake where we're trying to get 2 to 2.2 grams per kilo, that even without exercise over the course of 12 weeks, you can totally recomp your body. So we go from sarcopenic or what they call skinny fat into having really high quality muscle and better body composition. That is so interesting. I've heard this term, it was actually years ago when I um, used to work for a company and this girl next to me said, I got my, um, my body composition tested out and they said that I'm skinny fat. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what even is that? And she was explaining to me because she was lean looking, but she wasn't toned and I don't think she did much exercise. And she's like, this is skinny fat. And I think a lot of people do struggle with that, especially if they've been skinny when they were young. And then in the older years, they their body shape changes a bit where they're still small, but they actually do hold on to a lot of fat. 
Yes. And I've seen quite a few DEXAs recently where the woman doesn't do any strength training and she's in her forties upward and it's all about cardio and it's about eating clean. So she thinks she's eating really well, but her bone density is really low and she has a very high percentage or a high amount of visceral fat, even though on the outside, she looks super lean. If you were to look at the DEXA results and not knowing what she actually physically looks like from a clinical perspective, you would say this person is really needs some help. We need to get her to mm. be doing some exercise. So the skinny fat thing, I laugh because in research, we call it normal weight obesity. Really? So yeah. Yeah. When you have a higher percent body fat and we see a low quality of muscle, which is the predisposition to sarcopenia where you have more fat instead of muscle where muscle should be. Then um, we see a decrease in strength. We see a lot of health conditions. We see prediabetes. We see elevation and change in our blood lipids. And a lot of this happens in perimenopause as well. When women are so used to doing lots of cardio and not eating a lot and trying to stay lean, then we have a hormone shift and it changes the entire inside of what is happening. So it's one of those things where I talk about strength training coming from a massive endurance background, but it's so important mm. to have really good body composition as we get older. And that's the paramount thing is doing strength training. Mm. I want to start to talk about that because in my teenage years, when I was calories in, calories out, <laughs> I also just ran. That's all I did. I just ran like, you know, five, six days a week. I mean, it's way before kids. And you know, I sustained so many injuries. I ended up getting Morton's neuromas in my feet and, you know, you name it. And it, I, I couldn't run anymore because I, you know, had hurt my feet so much. And then I remember going on holidays and thinking like, I don't even look that good in bikinis. So why am I running so much? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I really was like, I'm going to get a PT. And early 20s, I got a PT. And within seriously a number of weeks, my whole body changed. And I was lucky to get abs. And I was like, well, like, this is so much more fun. And I don't have to run anymore. Like, you know, to six days a week or five days a week, what I was doing. And then as I've gotten older, having interviewed Vonda Wright, Mary Claire Haver recently, um, and then listening to your work, it has inspired me so much to start really with the strong weights and really Great. heavy weights, I should say. And I, it's just life-changing. I just actually changed to a different um, personal trainer and she's like the 31st best CrossFitter in the world. And nice. before I walked in today, I, I trained her on Monday and like I can't barely walk, not in a bad way, but in like it's just she's so – strict about the way that I do everything and how deep I'm getting in the squat. It, it's transformational. And I said it was funny that I was talking to you today as I'm like wobbling in um, to be <laughs> able to sit on the chair. But I think heavyweights is the best thing in the world. I would love you to tell us why you think heavyweights is what people and women especially should be doing and especially in middle age. Yeah. So if we're looking at women who are in their reproductive years. So I'm going to call it up to about 35. You can pretty much just do strength training and either go to failure or lift heavier and do some plyometric work. And you're going to see strength and some lean mass development. But once we hit perimenopause, which can start 30, sometimes even earlier than that, because we have the change in estrogen, we see the very first thing that goes is strength. I have so many women who are like, all of a sudden, I can't run as fast as I wanted and used to even a year ago. I can't open this jar of pickles. I feel like I have no strength and no power, but they haven't lost lean mass yet. And this is the very confusing part because we'll hear all this chatter about doing strength training. You don't have to lift heavy. But when we look specifically at women, estrogen is so ingrained with our skeletal muscle we see that it's responsible for how hard and strongly our contractile muscles actually bind together. And when estrogen starts to fluctuate or decrease, then myosin, one of those key proteins, starts to not do its job as well. So we can't get a really strong muscle contraction. 
we see that um, estrogen is really tightly tied to the basic satellite cell of our muscle cells. So when we start losing that, we're also losing an impetus for building lean mass. So if we're looking at lifting heavy weights, and it, it is a journey, so you're not going to go out and start lifting heavy right mm. away, because as you probably know with your new PT, it's all about form mm. and technique and being safe about it. But when we do that, we're creating more of a central nervous system response to then tell myosin, you better shape up and really bind tightly to actin so we can have really strong muscle contraction. And we also need to be able to regenerate our muscle tissue and build more muscle mass. So it becomes a different type of messaging with regards to how females female bodies maintain and build their strength. When we're seeing a lot of older women who are trying to lift to failure, they might put on some lean mass, but they don't get that strong. We see this in the literature where, yeah, you can lift lighter loads for um, higher reps, but you actually aren't going to get that power and strength component that we need and want. Because if you think about strength and power, it's about maintaining proprioception and balance. So if you're walking with groceries or you have an offload, you have one kid on a hip and another one mm. pulling you forward and you happen to stumble, then you have the ability to stop and, and, and right yourself really quickly. And that's what strength and power is when we're talking about the functionality of it in our daily life. And then we look about the load on the bone. If we're lifting heavier, then we have more load on the bone and the actual ability to keep our bone density instead of losing it. So there's a lot of things that are tied into the power end or the heavier loads for strength training when we start to get into peri and postmenopause. 